Hello and welcome to Stretford Paddock. This is the news on Friday the 16th of June. It has been kicking off for the last 24 hours and it continues to kick off this morning. We've got loads of stories about the latest on the takeover bids. It seems to all be pointing towards Sheikh Jassim and Qatar at the moment. We'll give you the latest on that. We've also got uh, an update from The Athletic talking about Onana as a potential new goalkeeper. We've also got a latest on Rasmus Hoyland as well. So there is loads to be getting on with. Get your thoughts in the comments. Give us your thoughts on this potential takeover from Qatar. Um, it looks as though they are the front runners. And we saw last night um, some reports out of Reuters saying that they were now negotiating for exclusivity in the rest of this um, takeover process. Basically, that if they were granted exclusivity by the Glazers, that they could only speak to Sheikh Jassim and his team um, as opposed to any other potential bidders. Now, initially, that was interpreted by us and, and by others as well um, as Reuters saying that this negotiation exclusivity, exclusivity had already been granted, which wasn't the case. Um, there were then a sort of a host of rumours that came out, or reports, sorry, rather than rumours from the likes of Simon Stone um, and other sort of British-based journalists, and even, I think, Ben Jacobs out of America as well, saying that this wasn't the case um, and that the Glazers wouldn't be granting exclusivity to anyone throughout the process, um, whether that be Sheikh Jassim or Jim Ratcliffe and his team. Um, they, that's where we got up to last night with things. Then there was this whole sort of conversation over you know, how reliable is Reuters? A lot of people rightly saying that in terms of finances, they are one of the most reliable companies and, and publications in the world um, and that they probably aren't getting this wrong. Then obviously there was the, the pushback from the British side of things. It was a very much a sort of tug of war of information. Um, so then you're just looking for who is taking up which side. Um, and this morning we saw RMC come out um, and they are obviously a big publication out of France uh, and they are backing up the Reuters uh, information here saying, as you can see at the bottom there, unless you want to read it in French at the top, uh, as announced by Reuters, information confirmed by RMC Sport, Qatar, and they go one step further where Reuters said they are negotiating for exclusivity. RMC go as far as to say they are about to enter into exclusive negotiations, saying that this will happen uh, with the Glazer family, the owners of Manchester United, for the takeover of the English club. Now, I... I'm not sure whether that is a, a, a translation phrasing that saying of is about to enter. I don't know if for sure, but to me that sounds like a step ahead. Obviously, what, you know, one person saying, "Well, we're chatting about whether we're going to do it," and someone else saying, "We're about to do it." They are, you know, one is, is is more advanced than the other. It's just whether that exact phrase in Qatar is about to enter into exclusive negotiations is the correct translation from the French there. Um, but if we can. Can we have a look and try and impasse de rentre? That sounds like about to enter, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, rentre has to be enter, okay? And pass. Come on, it feels right. It feels like they're saying they're about to enter that. Um, so, you know, maybe someone who's, who's more flu of a fluent French speaker than me could correct me. But just looking at the words, they do look like it's saying are about to enter negotiations exclusives. That is AVEC with the Glazer family. Look at this basic year 70, year nine French coming in handy here. Le Qatar, we know what that means. Come on, we don't need to be speaking French to, to know what Le Qatar means. Serrate there, that word there. Don't know what that means. And pass, some about uh, to enter, are about to enter negotiations exclusives. I think we can safely say that that translation is correct. Um, bloody hell, look at this, me speaking French on a Friday morning. Uh, who'd have thunk it? Um, I mean, producer Callum's got it up on the screen here. Bring that back over. Uh, it's uh, apparently pass de rentre uh, is go home in English. So apparently... Qatar are about to go home with some exclusive negotiations. I don't know what that means. That's only muddied the waters there, Callum. So thank you for that. Um, but it does seem to me that obviously what RMC Sport are saying definitely is that they are backing up the Reuters article saying that this period of, ne of exclusive negotiation is about to happen. Um, and that is obviously massive because that means basically that Qatar is very much the firm favourite for the new um, ownership of Manchester United. You wouldn't enter exclusive negotiations with someone um, and then you know do your best to not make that deal happen. 
except for the fact that this is the Glazers we're talking about. So really, anything is possible. Do you know what I mean? If this was anyone else, I would say, if they're entering exclusive negotiations, barring the sort of financial equivalent of a failed medical, this is going to happen. However, with the Glazers, even then, you don't know. You, you, you simply don't know. Um, and, you know, it's it sort of, again, in relation to that, um, this is from James Ducker last night from The Telegraph. He said, multiple sources close to talks played down claims from new agency Reuters <clears throat> that Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al Thani is negotiating exclusively ahead of his rivals. Effectively, the same could be said of Sir Jim Ratcliffe, one insider pointed out. So there is still a sort of very much a back and forth on this. <clears throat> Pardon me. What we do know is the latest sort of article, again, out of RMC Sport in the last hour, is saying that Qatar are about to enter an exclusive negotiating period for um, the purchase of Manchester United with the Glazers, which is obviously a massive step um, in the direction of selling them the, the full club. Uh, we've got a couple of Super Chats before we move on to our next story. Mikkel Tysland says, Jessim has made this whole process look unprofessional. His comments about his previous comments about players he wants to bring in give me no confidence. I mean, we haven't seen any official comments from him. Um, I don't think we have. Uh, anything that's that in terms of comment has been sort of rumour and report rather than any quote. So I would take all of that with a pinch of salt, to be honest. Um, but, you know, I, I, see, I see your point. The thing that surprises me is we heard the rumours last week, again, from all the most reliable journalists saying, Qatar have done a take it or leave it off or after that they won't negotiate. And then he went... Well, actually, no, they'll leave the offer on the table. So if you want to take that, you can, uh, but we're not going to give you any bigger offer. So that sort of all felt a bit like, were well, you changing your mind at the last minute because no one accepted your offer? But who knows? Again, all of these things have been sort of filtered through the mouths and, and words of journalists rather than straight from the, the source. So, yeah, Sleeping Bear says, so it's as clear as mud, pretty much, yeah. We've got one set of journalists and, and reporters saying that the negotiation period and the exclusivity of that negotiation is about to become active with um, Sheikh Jassim. And another set of journalists saying that isn't the case and that uh, Jim Ratcliffe and his team are still actively negotiating with the Glazers as well. I think even going as far as to say last night um, from certain uh, British sources that they think um, Jim Ratcliffe is still in the lead. Um, yeah, this was from Matt Lawton and, and, and Matt Dickinson in the Times. New owner unlikely to be in place before the start of the season. And Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos remain favourites to take over Old Trafford. Um, which, you know, that was 13 hours ago. So nine o'clock last night, we were still hearing that Jim Ratcliffe was the favourite. Um, so it really is a, a sort of bizarre situation that we find ourselves in at the minute. This, this story, though, and, and I don't know if we've got this coming up, but... Um, New owner unlikely to be in place for the start of the season, which is just fucking mental, in it? Um, the one thing I would say about that, um, if, you want, if you want to be slightly optimistic as United fans, is that was, that, from what I read, that was based on the technical elements of having to sign off so many different bits of, of legislature and of, of, of paperwork that it would take weeks for the full handover to take place. Do you know when you've got a job and you, you get a new job and sometimes the person who is leaving that job will sort of sit with you for a week and make sure that you know what you're doing? I think it's the equivalent of that. You know, for all intents and purposes, as soon as a, a bidder is a confirmed bidder or a, a preferred bidder is agreed, the deal is accepted. You can then start seeing the work taking place from the new owners. You know, if if, if Jim Ratcliffe or Sheikh Jassim wants to sanction certain transfers, wants to push ahead with certain structural changes, they can still do that. It's just that the the actual paperwork dotting the i's crossing the t's is probably going to take about six weeks. So I wouldn't I wouldn't read too much into that I wouldn't I wouldn't let that upset you I think as United fans we've got other things to worry about rather than the sort of technical aspects of well yes it's going to take six more weeks but that's because you are selling and handing over uh, six billion quids worth of worth of business so you know it is annoying but I think the new owner will be able to make changes will be able to sanction transfers as soon as a deal is agreed uh, and, and contracts are beginning to be signed 
we don't have to wait for this like final last minute thing from everything I've seen. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, right, let's move on. And um, this is again from The Athletic. I think we, we quoted The Athletic before, didn't we, with some of the uh, Jim Ratcliffe stuff. This is Onana. Um, and this is coming out of, uh, like I said, The Athletic. Uh, I think it was Laurie Whitwell um, with this one. Um, yeah, it was. It was Laurie Whitwell and Mario Cortenega. They are saying Manchester United are considering a move for Inter Milan goalkeeper Andre Onana. De Gea is out of contract this summer, and although he has agreed in principle to extend his 12-year stay and has communicated his intention to return to the club after his holiday, a new deal has not yet signed. United are therefore looking at the goalkeeper market, with Onana one of the options discussed. Chelsea have also held talks with the 27-year-old. Ten Hag worked with Onana during their time at Ajax, where the Cameroonian first caught the eye with his exceptional passing range and confidence with his ball at his feet. Sorry, the ball at his feet, not his balls. Uh, those skills were on display during Inter Milan's run to the Champions League final. Um, Ten Hag would ideally like a goalkeeper naturally suited to playing out from the back, but United also have to consider financial implications with a priority a centre forward and a midfielder, which we'll get to in a minute. The latest on a, on a fucking centre forward, which is becoming again an absolute joke. Uh, should De Gea leave the club, uh, those priorities, however, would shift, making an approach for Onana more likely. He moved to the San Siro on a free transfer last year, but has a contract till 2027. And here's the kicker, and Inter may demand up to 70 million as a fee. Yay! A goalie that was a free transfer 12 months ago because he failed a drugs test and Ajax didn't want him anymore. We have to now pay 70 million quid for him. And speaking of 70 million quids, which is basically just a single token in the United transfer wallet, isn't it? Because no one's less than 70 million anymore. Mason Mount, uh, Andre Onana, and as it turns out, Rasmus Hoyland, uh, as we can see here. Uh, Manchester United's pursuit of the Atlanta striker Rasmus Hoyland is looking more unlikely with his evaluation thought to be around 80 million pounds, which again, what on earth is the world coming to? When you look at Rasmus Hoyland, and for some reason I've just put him into Google, and it has instinctively taken me to a journey to Rasmus Hoyland. It thinks it's a place. Um, let me do that again. I just want to just double check um, some of the guy's stats. 20 years old, we know that. Um, remember, this is a, a player that they want £80 million pounds for, and, and, and this is not meant to be me knocking him. I love that he's a United fan. He looks to be a very good up-and-coming striker. I think he would be a good signing for Manchester United as a backup option. In his career, this season, he's got 16 goals, 7 assists, which is pretty good. But you've got to remember that three of those goals have come in the Austrian first division that they weren't even in, for, in Serie A. So, again, you, you're taking a, a hit in terms of... Um, the, the quality and standard of opposition there. Two of those goals came in the Austrian Cup. Um, so, again... You know, that isn't exactly the, the, the most difficult competition in the world. He's got nine goals and four assists for Atalanta in the league this season in 32 games. That's a goal every four games, just about. And we're looking at 80 million quid for him. Like, what, what, is, what is football? What is the transfer market? I know Chelsea, it's almost like Chelsea have ruined it for everyone now, aren't they? Because they paid 80 million for... Um, for Fana, they paid 110 million for Enzo Fernandez. They're just paying ridiculous money for everyone. But this, this is sort of double-edged sword of negativity. This because on the first hand, United obviously should not be expected to pay 80 million quid for a, a, a man who was released by his uh, who was it he played for in Denmark. Sorry, let me just double-check that again. Um, he was released by them um, 12 months ago. Um, it was Bromby. Uh, Sorry, Copenhagen. He was released by Copenhagen 12 months ago um, and is now being sort of brought into the Atalanta team. He's done pretty well. He's got nine goals in the league this season. But again, no offence, nine goals in the league this season. He's got less goal contributions this season for Atalanta than Casemiro has for Man United. Like, that, to me, isn't the standard of player as a striker that um, we should be talking about in terms of being 80 million. Apparently, we've got a, a little updated tweet here um, in the past few hours, um, Atalanta have rejected the first offer from the Premier League um, worth €35 million Euros for Rasmus Hoyland. I guess that is Man United, as it says they're most likely Manchester United. Um, and that's from Tuto Atalanta, apparently. I mean, that makes more sense, doesn't it? But this idea of spending 80 million quid on him is, is absolutely 
absolute ridiculous. I mean, I, I can't see United doing that. And to be honest, if, if we're honest with ourselves, I don't actually think Atalanta would demand 80 million euros for him or 80 million quid, whatever it was. 100 million euros is, is what that translates to. There is no way they value him as highly as Jude Bellingham is, is valued. You know, Jude Bellingham has been starting week in, week out um, for every team he's played for since he was 15 um, and is one of the most highly regarded youngsters in the world. Um, and he's went for, what was it, 90 million rising to 115 million? Like, similar kind of numbers um, to what we, they want for Hoyland. Th th I don't think they will stick to that. But yeah, um, that is uh, Darmesh. Obviously, if you didn't see the interview we did with Darmesh yesterday, go and check that out. Uh, it's got some talk about Holland on there as well. Also, for the first time, I would say from a, a sort of senior journalist, linking Manchester United with Marcus Turam as well, which is um, a player who's on a free transfer this summer, who it does seem as though um, is wanted by a lot of Europe. He could potentially be a, a transfer for Manchester United this summer. I'm going to get into some of the comments. Let me know your thoughts on the latest... Um, Although I say the latest, we don't really know the latest on the ownership stuff because it's literally a, a, a sort of a war of opinion at the minute. You've got Reuters and you've got RMC Sport on one side saying that anywhere from um, Sheikh Jassim is negotiating for exclusivity to he's about to enter a period of exclusivity. Then you've got the sort of British journalists on one side saying not only is that not the case, but some journalists going as far as to say that Jim Ratcliffe is still the front runner for, for the takeover of Manchester United. And all of these are reliable. That, that's the thing that doesn't make sense saying opposite things to each other. You know, they can't both be true. Um, we'll see. Um, Murtar can't sell, only over pays when he buys. That's Paul Lucas. I mean, he's only had one sum of, of selling players and you know, I don't think that's particularly a fair estimation of, of his talents. We don't know. He's had one summer trying to sell people. That was last year. Um, before that, it's, it's been Woodward and, and others, hasn't it? Um, uh, yeah, Moy Simpatico says, have you read the Athletic article on the Jim Ratcliffe ownership of Nice over the past four years? Came out today. Yeah, uh, there seems to be a little bit of discontent um, from the Nice fans. Basically, they're, they they haven't really improved since, since Jim Ratcliffe took them over. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's not neither side have got a, a sort of blemish-free track record in terms of the footballing side of things. Hoyland only scored eight league goals. Um, Hoyland too expensive. But how many? How are we going to keep... Like, Hoyland was already a sort of... Not second choice, but he was meant to be a backup. Then we can't get Kane. So now Hoyland's elevated to, like, so far our only target as a, as a striker. And then now he's 80 million. We can't get him. So that's the main target in Kane we can't get. That's the backup in Hoyland we can't get. Like... Surely we can't end up with our third and fourth choice player in every position because at some point we just we're not going to improve the team. You know, there's a, there's a case to be made that Hoyland isn't a gigantic improvement over a sort of Martial. He's just fitter and younger. Um, but you've got to think about who we're actually fielding week in week out here. Are United going to be made better by you know a third and fourth choice options? I'm not sure we will. Um, Lucky Singh says no bidding for Manchester United, please. Okay, Lucky Singh says that, so I guess we go with that. Um, Chris353 says, end up with Rabio. Um, Kevin Fitz says, Gonzalo Ramos, FFS. Um, maybe, but again, no one's, no one's really linked us with him, have they? Uh, Anonymous Mango saying the same thing is available for 80 million plus add-ons. <sighs> yeah, fine, but we need people, we need people to get him. You know, we need people to link us with him. We need United to actually try and sign him. So far, that's not been the case, has it? Um, Sajo James John says if the Glazers don't sell immediately Rashford might leave like Russo well Rashford can't leave because he's got time left on his contract I think he's got a year left after this year hasn't he um, so he can't leave um, not now anyway unless we want him to um, if we splurge 80 million on Rasmus why not have put that money towards Kane or Ossiman no way it happens for that money I think you're right no way it happens for that money is the first thing and secondly I don't think I don't think Tottenham would have sold Kane for any less than 120, 130 million. I think if we could have got Kane for 100 million, we would have done that. Um, but I don't think we could have, um, unfortunately. Right, that's going to be all for me this morning. We are going to be back this afternoon as well with another Transfers Live, wrapping up everything we've got. And then actually, is it Transfer Live? It's The Brew. 
It's the brew coming out this afternoon, actually, 4 o'clock. It'll be me, it'll be Jay, and, of course, it'll be Stephen Housen on the brew. So make sure you are back here for that. And tomorrow will be the return of the transfer review. Stephen Housen with his weekly wrap-up of all the Manchester United transfer news. You come here for the news, but really, if you want to know if a transfer is actually happening, you check out the transfer review. That is coming back tomorrow morning, so stick around. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. Also, it is crucial at this time of year, hit the notification bell because we go live every time there is breaking news. You don't want to miss anything, so hit that notification bell, hit subscribe. Let's get to 700,000 subscribers, only 2,000 subscribers away. There's 2,000 people watching this now. If you all hit subscribe, you know what I mean? We're hitting our targets. So let's get to 700,000 subscribers and hit that notification bell. I've been Joe. This has been the news. We'll see you in a bit.